Kidney. 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 In the library, I think. In the library, in the rehearsal area. Yeah, in the green room area. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Looking forward Good afternoon. to another wonderful session today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for being here. I never miss Siegel and Megha's uh, programs at all because they're always so good. And I praise Siegel's uh, programs to so many people. We are lucky to be a part of it. Yes, yes. No, she's very organized. Very, very organized. <clears throat> Okay. 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 I'm keeping myself on mute because of all the traffic sound. So whenever I need to, I'll unmute myself. Cow on mat. You, you, you. Oh, did that jump it?
Shall we begin? We're yeah, I guess so. I guess we can. yeah. I think yeah. Uh, if yeah. there are late comers, they can always join. Of course. Yeah, yeah. So. Good evening, everybody, and a warm welcome <clears throat> once again to what promises to be yet another very interesting uh, session. I am not going to introduce Sujan and Sumana once again because I presume that all those who are here were here yesterday too. And a lot of the people who were here yesterday are missing today, but that's fine. Um, so Sujan, Shumana, please take over. Sure. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, Megha. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we had a really interesting uh, session yesterday. Many of you were there for it. I don't know if there was anyone, if there's anyone here today who wasn't a part of uh, the session yesterday. If so, and if you feel that you know, you're suddenly being thrown in the deep end, just let us know. We can do a very quick recap, maybe. But <laughs> and yeah, so let's let's get right to it. This is um, part of what we call time traveling through art, which is essentially uh, an education program that we run from DAG Museums, um, which is essentially a kind of journey through the history of Bengal through artworks. So yeah, so I'll take you to the uh, interactive viewing room that we have and we can start from there. Okay, so um, Yesterday, we had more or less covered from the late 1700s, uh, which is the period just after the Battle of Plassey, when the English are gaining, um, I mean, gaining ground in Bengal and in India as well. And we were looking at some of these histories, some very contested histories, like the history of the Black Hole and um, its subsequent memorialization and uh, opposition to that kind of memorialization. We were also looking at a few of the other colonies as well as the, uh, the, the arrival of the first kind of um, schools of training in Western art, which were um, teaching this mode of painting, which, was, which, which came into a very interesting dialogue with um, indigenous traditions, not just of art, but also of storytelling, indigenous traditions in terms of narratives, and produced a very, very fascinating sort of um, period of painting, which, which is known as the early Bengal or the Dutch Bengal school. And following that, we looked at the early 20th century, especially oh, no. from the works of um, Abhinindranath Tagore, uh, Nandalal Bosch and Nandalal Boshu and um, later uh, we were also looking at Shunayani Devi who was um, the, I mean who didn't win a great deal of acclaim in her own time but uh, is, is recognized as one of modern India's first women artists to be identified by name uh, which is an important distinction to make because there was so much art that came out of uh, these local indigenous traditions that were by women and um, were, were anonymous. So today what we will do is we are kind of moving into the first 1920s, 1930s and looking at the art that is coming out at that period. So uh, we will start quickly by looking at these two works which are um, this is a time which is which is really very interesting uh, in terms of Indian art because um, there is a great deal of experimentation that is happening. So on the one hand, the nationalist movement is gaining momentum. We have had the first of the <laughs> cooperation movements. Uh, and uh, sorry, I'll just put. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, so it's, it's, it's that moment when this kind of nationalist movement is gaining ground and um, people like Abhinindranath Tagore are looking to find this kind of alternative to the Western art practice that was imported and that was taught to Indian students by looking for a pan-Asian cultural identity where they are essentially um, trying to 
in, I mean, imbibe elements of Japanese art, of, of East, of West Asian art and so on. Alongside that, another very significant um, event that takes place in, at this time is uh, the journey that Obanindranath Tagore's students undertake to the Ajanta Caves. So that's another very important sort of moment in, 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 in this history because um, this is the moment when the, the aesthetic traditions of ancient India, so to speak, um, very loosely termed, uh, begin to manifest themselves in the works of the Bengal school. In, in the works, i just kind of take you around a bit to that. This in particular is the work of someone called Oshit Kumar Haldar, who was a student of the Tagores, who was based very much, I mean, they, they were mostly training in Jorashako, which was the Tagore uh, house in Kolkata. And they had this studio in, inside Jorashako, which was called uh, the Bichitra studio. And in this Bichitra studio, they, they invited people from everywhere. And, and they had these, um, there was the south facing veranda where they would have these discussions on art. They would invite critics, they would invite practitioners, they would invite musicians and so on. And it was just a very um, kind of vibrant environment where all these different traditions were coming together. And what's also very interesting uh, at this point is that although we are looking at mm. this from a nationalist point of view, this becomes this kind of uh, response to Western art. Um, these, uh, these journeys to the Ajanta Caves didn't begin in the early 20th century. They began in the mid 19th century. And most of the people who are going on these excavations and pretending to discover uh, India's ancient heritage, of course, the Ajanta Caves weren't uh, altogether forgotten. They find mention in the Akbar Nama and uh, so on. But um, in most cases, when Europeans come across something, they are they, they seem to have, I mean, in the 19th, 20th century, they seem to believe that they have discovered it. And that is the kind of uh, language that we also um, start to use. That's the vocabulary that, that we also tend to internalize a bit. And so at this point, we have this other influence that's coming in, um, the Ajanta Caves. So some of Abunindranath's students go to the Ajanta Caves. They spend two winters there copying all the murals that they found. I mean, this is probably a time when photography isn't as, so developed that you can uh, take pictures inside the caves. And um, I, I mean, you wouldn't get uh, the truest colors and so on because it's in any case black and white. And so these uh, artists, they spent two winters painting. Abunindranath was, I mean, typically very considerate of his students and he sent with them a cook who would just ensure that his students got the got got square meals a day. And um, upon returning, this became kind of um, one of the new modes in which they started painting. And just another sort of influence that we find around this time as part of the Bengal school is, um, is something that we see in this work by Muhammad Abdurrahman Chuktai who later was recognized as a national artist of Pakistan because of his contributions to uh, the Pakistani cultural milieu uh, after independence as well. And Chuktai here, as you can see, I mean, this is, this painting is titled Worship. It's actually one of the newest additions to the Ghare Baide collection. And Chuktai was, I mean, he was very much part of this Bengal school of art where you see this kind of wash, these gradients, these soft lights, these elongated fingers and all of this. But at the same time, you can tell that he is drawing on this kind of art nouveau tradition, which, which you see in illustrations of Omar Khayyam's Rubaiyat and um, other works from the early 20th century, late 19th century. So um, I guess what I... Uh, thank you, thank you. Hey. Uh, the question that... It, I mean, that I like to think about when... Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, when I think of, when I look back at these uh, artworks, is, you know, how, I mean, how uh, well-defined is this idea of nationalism? So, and and is nationalism really just about looking inwards? Is it just about, you know, shunning everything that is coming from outside? Is, or, or is there something, is there a much more pluralistic idea, a much more syncretist idea of nationalism that we find in the early 20th century in the, in the works of these artists of the Bengal school. So 
I'll just pause here for a bit and maybe if uh, any of you would like to kind of come in and sort of look back at what we have been discussing about this early period, which in the history of Bengal, in the history of nationalist history of India is kind of um, referred to as the Swadeshi period or this kind of period of a phase where we're going through the first wave of the non-cooperation movement and so on. And uh, whether you would like to think of any of these specific artworks and try to think of questions that students could be asked based on this. So what would be the talking points if we want to use these artworks and try to uh, question the narrative that we are more familiar with? Can I say something? Sure, please. Um, you know, you just mentioned about uh, this uh, interest in Ajanta and, mm -hmm. you know, the copying of uh, quite independently, I think around the same time, maybe 1940s or so, um, in Hyderabad, mm -hmm. uh, the state, the former, the His Highness, the Nizam's Dominion's Department of Archaeology, mm -hmm. they also commissioned people to actually make life-size uh, portfolios of all these uh, paintings, uh, and of course they are they are still here, and they were like uh, the the di the director director I think was a person called Gulam Yazdani, I see, the I first see. director general. Now I'm, I was just wondering because you were like talking in terms of the fact that you know this um, nationalist inspiration and so on and so forth. So I was wondering how this would apply to different regions. I know your focus mm -hmm. is Bengal, but there was this such a striking similarity. And of course, uh, Hyderabad state didn't go through the same historical, course, yeah. uh, you know, because it was uh, under the Nizam, it was a princely state. Of course, there were Sorajni Raidu and, uh, you know, the entire Indian national mm -hmm. Congress and all. But, uh, so I was wondering what would have been the motivation for this group of people to do it? Is it just because it was part of their dominions or what? I mean, any reflections? No, that's a very interesting thought. Uh, is there anyone who else wanted to come in? Okay, probably not. Um, thank you, ma'am. Thanks. Thanks for that question. Um, my sense is that, you know, uh, the, the Bengal school weren't the first to do this to begin with. I mean, even before that, there was this expedition in the mid 19th century that was led by John Griffiths, who uh, took students to. Uh, Out of the JJ School of Art, so from yeah, Bombay. Yeah, yeah. So from Bombay, he took took a bunch of students to uh, the Ajanta, and they did a set of paintings, some of which were okay. sent to the Victoria and Albert uh, Museum in London. Some of it stayed at the JJ School of Art as well. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure that, you know, uh, when we think of this in terms of um, nationalism, uh, I, I, I'm not even trying to posit that the Bengal school was particularly um, nationalist in its motivations when they, when they went off to, this, um, to the Ajanta Caves to do these uh, paintings and copies. I, I think it was more a kind of... Uh, it was also trying to breathe new life into the visual arts of, of, of that time. And that's, I think, I mean, partly there is an archaeological interest, partly there's a historical interest in terms of trying to, you know, connect with um, what is understood to be the nation's past. I mean, mm. this, this sense of building, the sense of continuity. And I would sense that I'm not sure the exact conditions under which um, the Nizam uh, mm -hmm. and under his dominion, this was commissioned, but mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry. It's very unique, no, that the Nizam state was some of the first things that they did was, mm -hmm. one was a discovering a janta, the other was excavating sites, early Buddhist sites and so on. Mm -hmm. now, I just raised this point because you mentioned that this is with reference to the way teaching and so on. So the particularity, particularity yeah. of, uh, of differences region-wise, I think maybe perhaps a point that we can highlight. Absolutely. That's a yeah. very, very interesting yeah. uh, point yeah. to discuss. For thank sure. you. No, thank you. Thank you for that comment. Um, is there anyone else who would like to share? I, I just uh, want to jump yeah. in and say that as per what Topati Gohatakuda writes, Professor Topati Gohatakuda about 
needed. It was a quite a concerted effort and supported a lot by different princely states. I think even in Golconda, there was a mission of the Bag Caves that were being supported at yeah. uh, this time, uh, where um, a lot of the princely states in Baroda as well with Sayaji Rao. So a lot of the princely states were supporting this kind of um, exploration of India's past because there was. It was a subconscious or conscious attempt to uh, go against this idea that was that was prevalent in colonial circles that you know India didn't have a strong visual culture. We may have a strong sculpture tradition of sculpture and architecture, but we didn't have a visual language, so to speak. So it was a way to counter that and to say, look, this is how far back our visual language goes. And then they were really trying desperately to connect it, you know, like almost like a continuous legacy without any disruption, you know, through the Rajasthani and Pahari and Mughal paintings. But then they realized, no, maybe it's not, we can't connect all of it. But there was this which is along with the Swadeshi movement and the non kwarkha movement, there's a conscious attempt of local rulers and local leaders to support local artists to rediscover this ideal past. And by that also, fall into certain traps of glorifying the Hindu and the Buddhist past versus, you know, slowly, even though Obanindranath started with Mughal art, at some point that also got left behind. And then he came back to it in his work later on in the 1940s again. Uh, so yeah, so there was a sort of th this, you know, this this very direct attempt to do this uh, at a political and at a cultural level in many ways. Yeah, yeah thank, thanks for that. And I think, uh, Chukte again is one of those examples where we find him constantly uh, referring back to um, this kind of, uh, it's it's in a way, uh, I guess, um, sits a little uncomfortably vis-a-vis -vis the Orientalism that we find in the Art Nouveau tradition in, in, in the way that uh, Omar Khayyam is um, portrayed, I mean, Rubaiyat is, is, is painted. But at the same time, it, it certainly does come across as a kind of exception in this general tradition. The other artist, of course, who goes back to uh, some of these uh, And it is one that Shujan jumping yeah. in, even Chuktai traveled to Ajanta. So it was almost like yeah, a rite yeah. of passage for artists at that time to travel to these places in search of this past. And again, it's interesting on how history becomes so important in any contemporary moment and who and writing and rewriting and reclaiming history becomes so important Absolutely. at these very important junctures yeah. of our of our nation's past and you know contemporary times as well. So. Um, but Shumona, you just used the word ideal past. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, amongst the nationalists, at least nationalist historians, uh, uh, sometimes looking at Ajanta and Elora didn't quite fit in. Uh, with the uh, kind of Victorian ideas that they had about women's bodies and how women were depicted. There's a long discussion in A.S. Altekar's book on women in Hindu civilization, where he's making great attempts to explain how uh, the clothing was, uh, was I mean, you know, it, they got there because plaster fell off and all kinds of very funny. It's like a 13 pages of absurd writing. So when you say that it is like search for an ideal past. I guess I mean, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. You were saying. Yeah. 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 So, so this question of an ideal Hindu and Buddhist past was actually quite uncomfortable uh, in some senses to the uh, nationalist, modernist nationalist perspective. Now, what y'all are doing is really fascinating because it sort of tells us about how these uh, contradictions, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, on the one hand, you want to search for your true, so-called true or, or pure, pristine yeah. past. And that's why I raised the Nizam thing and, uh, I mean, the Hyderabad state thing, because, I mean, here you're really not, I mean, for, for the foundations of the Nizam state would not be looking at a Buddhist or, a, uh, you know, your uh, Hindu identity or whatever. So the impulses must have been something different. And this is where the artistic, that's why I asked this question because you both are so engaged with the, um, the craft of uh, you know, understanding art, whereas you know, we look at it as a source of information. Also, I think the primary instinct is like you're saying to look at it as a source of information, but it's just, I mean, I, I mean, my training isn't also in art history, so it's only after I joined DAG that I have tried to kind of um, look for these clues as well and try to uh, destabilize, like you're saying, this um, the idea of uh, these narratives that we inherit about uh, the nationalist movement. And um, so 
zooming back quite literally out of that for a moment, um, and there's this is these are the works of Gogonindranath Tagore, who I mean I won't go into detail about what Gogonindranath is doing, but it's it's part of this whole. Um, I mean this is a work that I mean this is basically his ink on paper work, which is which he later titled something like the Education Mill or the University Mill or something, where um, this was again part of what Abhinindranath, Chunani Devi, Rabindranath Tagore himself and Gavanindranath were doing, which was kind of launching a critique of Western education. And this was part of the Shadeshi moment. I mean, continues well after that as well. And, and you can see in this work that there are these three dimensional figures who enter into this kind of industrial setup and are uh, sort of sent out, I mean, almost spat out by this roller, which kind of turns them into two dimensional objects who can't stand on their own feet. And um, Gogonindranath, I mean, the reason why uh, he's interesting in all of this is particularly because he is not, uh, I mean, he is influenced by the Japanese artists who come to Bengal. He has uh, kind of tried to work with their use of wash. They, I mean, the artists here have, I mean, Obanindranath, Nandura, Obanindranath, Shunani Devi, above all, have reinterpreted this wash uh, technique in their own way, which gives it, I mean, which, which, which is a significant kind of departure from the oil uh, traditions that, that the Western educated artists were uh, using. But uh, Govanindranath is at this point, you know, I mean, caught between worlds, I mean, in a, in a good way. And uh, he's also looking west for influences. He is experimenting with his own specific interpretation of cubism, which, I mean, if you look at this work, it's something that I strongly feel, uh, especially because Gogonindranath was often into designing the theater stage, which is that it's not so much cubism that is um, talking about, you know, perspective in a philosophical way necessarily, but also talking about perspectives through this kind of three-dimensionality that he uh, brings out of the stage and, and in terms of this kind of uh, different shards of light that are coming in and all of that. And there is this lovely uh, postcard which we have at uh, Ghore Baire, which was written by Abhinindranath Tagore to uh, his pupil Nandalal Bosch's daughter, where he uh, makes fun of Gavanindranath's um, cubism and he paints something in the cubist style and he calls it the new infectionism. So in a sense, in this nationalist move, move moment, there are all these kinds of different uh, influences that are coming into art, constantly trying to challenge um, what this new Indian art is going to look like, uh, where its future lies. And um, ultimately, I mean, what happens, we'll see in the next room. But um, I think a little while back, Saloni was asking if we use nationalist to indicate the search for own unique style. Um, I mean, that is certainly part of what uh, these artists are trying to do. Um, I mean, to begin with, like the Shodeshi movement ideals, I think it starts with uh, a, an intention to, you know, look away from the West, look for alternatives uh, first. And then comes this idea, I guess, of uh, a new, new uh, independent style that becomes identifiable as this kind of new India of what new Indian art will look like. So, um, which is of course somewhat different from the move, I mean, from the trajectory that the nationalist movement itself is taking. So um, I'll just move on to the next room because there's quite a lot of ground that we would like to cover. We'll not go through the whole of it, of course. We'll not go through each painting separately, but uh, let's try and see how much we can do make sense of this room. So here we start in the 1930s when this wave of modernism that, um, you know, it's modernism, I mean, in terms of the ideas are something that's different from uh, aesthetic modernism. So in the sense that the ideas of what modernist art will look like is is uh, is something that you know tries to mark a break from the past in in that particular geography's tradition so it doesn't necessarily mean that you uh, 
uh, imitate modernist artists in Europe, but it just means that you stop imitating or you stop, uh, you know, in a sense, you stop being in a continued discussion with the traditions that you inherit yourself and you reimagine uh, the past in a very different way. And so apart from this kind of influence that was coming in from the East and from the West, there are artists like Shunaini Devi, like Jamini Rai, like Nandalal Bosch, who, Bosch, who are actually looking um, to the folk traditions. So they are not looking at India's ancient glorified past, but they are rather trying to find um, new energy, new kind of, you know, new power to... Um, embolden art in that moment and <clears throat> this is 1930s and at this point Mahatma Gandhi uh, he asks uh, Nandalal Bose to sorry I'll just um, yeah he asks Nandalal to you know design the pavilion for the Haripura session of the Indian National Congress. So this is in 1937. In 1936, the Fezpur Congress that took place, even there, the Congress are at this time deliberately making an attempt to locate themselves not within the city spaces, not within these urban centers, but in the rural areas. And Gandhi asks Nandalal to come and uh, create the Fezpur uh, pavilion. And Nandalal does a brilliant job, in fact, if, if any of you are interested in looking at some of his work there, you can find we have been um, doing a collaborative uh, exhibition with uh, the Center for Studies in Social Sciences and Victoria Memorial Hall. Um, I've just um, put the link in the chat. So at some point, if you want to go and have a look at his work there, that's mainly on Nandulal Bosho's postcards, but there's also his sketches from Haripura and Fezpur in that. So Nandulal is asked to design this and um, Gandhi, being Gandhi, tells Nandulal that, you know, you can't uh, use anything other than natural dyes. And Nandulal, of course, I mean, he is an extremely versatile artist. He has set up uh, the school in Shantiniketan. He's known as the Master Moshai because, I mean, he's virtually a teacher to every student, no matter what they want to learn. And he is up for this challenge. I mean, he takes a bunch of his students. He lands up in Haripura which is in Gujarat, and um, Nandalal starts to interact with people from the villages and he tries to get a sense of their rhythms of life, the colors that they are using, and, and he comes up with this incredible series of some 88 large posters that uh, depict the everyday life of the people. And it's, I mean, it's hard to imagine given our current, I mean, given the political climate that, you know, someone of uh, that stature is going designing this uh, congress pavilion putting up all of these posters that are talking about the, the people and their everyday lives it's quite remarkable and um, what he's doing is also you know he's, he's in a sense i mean breaking out of um, a lot of the formal traditions that that uh, he has worked with so far and it's also really interesting to note that you know i'm sure there will be among us architecture historians who will have noticed this already, that he places most of these under this kind of onion-shaped, multi-tiered multi Mughal arches. And um, that's true of most of the works that he paints in this series, very rustic colors, very, again, um, probably sitting, as uh, Man was saying, um, uncomfortably with this idea of India. Um, it's, 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 it's a really quite a remarkable kind of, um, phase and and to to think of you know this being the i mean projected image of the congress session is there um, in the same breath we could also think of the work of jamini roy although he is coming from a very different place and um, jamini roy of course in in his early days he was trained academically in the in the western mode of art but um, he, he gradually gave that up like Obanindranath. He wanted to find something that was Indian. He wanted to find something that was, um, in a sense, this is where also it gets interesting because, because it's an assertion of this kind of regional cultural identity within the broader rubric of this nationalist movement. And so Jamini Roy is part of this whole um, group of 
collectors as well as artists who are you know who, who archive um who are looking to archive the rural the, yeah sorry so uh, he's he's part of this group who are looking to archive document and represent um the folk traditions of uh, bengal and this of course becomes a very very important uh, moment in terms of the political identity of this folk art because um it's it's quite interesting because i mean the people who start this kind of folk art movement um inherit their ideas of this kind of you know idealized notion of all that is non urban non industrial and they seem to think that it is in these villages in these traditions that have remained untouched by uh, any kind of influence that therein lies the true spirit of the indian people and so on and so forth and people like uh, guru sadai that who start to collect um, these artworks they become i mean these collections really become the springboard from which uh, this kind of modernism takes off and very quickly it it becomes uh, i mean it it enters into discussion with marxist thinking that that's emerging in the 1920s and the 1930s and this phase becomes really i mean a lot of these discussions come to the fore um in terms of what the i mean what should be this national art what should be people's art and jamira of course is a great kind of you know champion of this idea of people's art of everyday art and he uh, starts to paint these scenes and he starts to paint things that are relatable but at the same time formally very very sort of um i mean it's it's really sort of well thought out it's really kind of there's a lot of attention given to the formal elements of this work but like um, gandhi's insistence that nandulal use uh, natural dyes jaminira also is doing the same thing he is not just painting these forms but he's actually using uh, he's actually producing his own paint he's producing the i mean he's he's bringing out the yellow from haldi he's using the suit of kitchen utensils to produce the ink black that you see in the, in his lines and he's turning to these kinds of you know the potua artists which are these um itinerant scroll painters and storytellers not just of bengal but i mean they are pretty much there in many many parts of india and in in south asia as a whole um so and and it it becomes a very interesting part of this whole discussion about you know what this people's art has to be i mean is it is it art that merely represents the people is it art that is made by the people is it art that is is communicable it's it's art that people understand and love and i mean i suppose in a way jaminira himself becomes i mean almost too too successful in what he is trying to achieve because i mean even now if you are moving around bengal the whole idea of they, what they, regional they, bengal art looks like i mean the, the first guess is you know you go back to jaminira and that is what essentially um, gives it a kind of visual identity so once again let me pause here for a bit because i think this is a very interesting phase in this kind of in this um, history of you know of art becoming self consciously political in a sense and um, both in the service of the national movement as well as in the service of regional nationalisms and um, reassessing the role of folk cultures in our everyday lives so again uh, my question to educators teachers whoever i mean musician ex- i mean museum um, specialist if you would like to kind of reflect on this and try to think of questions that we could raise about this that questions our uh, general perception of this period in indian history as we t- as we tend to learn it in schools and colleges any thoughts questions okay so uh, actually there is a 
since you referred to Potuas, I recall that you had hinted at Kaligat paintings yesterday. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the point of referring to the Kaligat paintings was basically this that, you know, the Kaligat painters, like we were discussing, were essentially a break off from the Potua tradition who settled in the cities, who saw it as a good center for um, commercial uh, art. And I mean, that's, that's again, a very, very strong influence on both Nandalal and Jamira at this point. And uh, how do we place it in this context is a very interesting question. It's something that, I mean, we have been grappling with for, I mean, I mean the artists themselves grappled with. It's not as if they were not aware of the political significance of this, um, because it, it kind of, you know, it's, it's a very interesting question to put to students as well. And this is something I like to think about, which is this question of when is it um, influence inspiration and when does it veer towards appropriation? So that's something that we tend to think like, I mean, it's, it's, it's an uncomfortable question. It's, it's one that reveals many different answers and um, different people respond to it in different ways as well. Um, but I mean, for Jamini Rai, of course, I mean, he was, I mean, he he was basing it on collections of folk art, on Potua artists, and uh, he was very confident. I mean, he was very uh, aware of exactly what he was doing and the influence that it would have on um, art after him. Because I mean, there have been a number of artists. I mean, even today, you find people who are, I mean, when whenever they are trying to find new way to draw the eyes. You, you really can't escape this kind of mode that Jamira pioneered and before him, Shuna Nidhi. So we'll just move to the early days of the Second World War. Sorry, uh, yeah. Uh, Aloka, ma'am, want to say something? Your videos on. Okay, okay, no problem. Yeah, yeah. okay, cool. Uh, uh, Keshav, can we come back to that a little later? Perhaps we'll definitely uh, take that up. I, you're asking if uh, the tradition of folk art in contestation with the art of high culture, or was there some overlap in themes and style? Yeah, I mean, that's that's something that we briefly were trying to discuss, but sure, we will definitely try to come back to that at the end of this uh, session, perhaps. Or if you have thoughts on it, you're also welcome to share them uh, with us. So... Uh, Shumana, there's only one point which we can take up later on. Mm -hmm. It's the whole question of the content of this modernist art and style and so on and so forth and the context in which folk art and other arts sort of, you know, evolved. So, I mean, yeah. I mean, I think this, I mean, your whole presentation is basically on seeing the evolution of modern Indian art, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, appropriation of the content is one thing, but uh, the modernist Style. I don't know whether one can use that yeah, word. Yeah, so maybe we can do it at the moment. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. I think that also ties in with what Keshav was asking. Yes. So I think, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, and suddenly from this kind of, you know, whether, I mean, whether we agree, whether we disagree with this whole idea of appropriation, um, whatever else we can call that, but there is a certain sense of um, idealism that's, I mean, of, of the ideal that's associated with uh, rural Bengal in particular. I mean, in the thinking of Rabindranath, in the thinking of, I mean, not so much in the thinking of Rabindranath. I mean, he is, of course, a very pragmatic thinker, but in his art or in the art of Nandalal Boshu or in the art of Jamini Rai, there is this um, sense of the ideal that's located in the rural um, in the rural spaces. And then the Second World War begins 1939. And by 1942, there is, of course, this kind of divide that is taking place because the left, I mean, some of the left leaders think that of paramount importance is supporting um, the battle against fascism. Whether, whereas there are Indians, I mean, of the nationalist, of the National Congress who believe that it is more important to gain independence first. And this is a question that never really, I mean, it gets resolved historically, of course, but I mean, it's, it's difficult to kind of come up with a definite answer of um, what would have been or, or how the history, uh, uh, how our history would have gone if it hadn't been one way and the other, it's, it's, it's an open-ended thing. And so in, in 1942, 
um, comes this devastating cyclone that rips through the southern districts of Bengal. And um, this is, this, I mean, completely sort of, it's, it's not, I mean, it's, it's, it's a devastating famine, but at the same time, there isn't really a great deal of uh, food shortage that's happening. It's just that Churchill and the, I mean, the entire colonial policy of food distribution was so, so uh, desperately lopsided and, um, I mean, it was so mismanaged that over 3.2 million people die in the famine that results from this cyclone. So while it was a kind of natural, natural disaster, the effects of it that, that people faced in their everyday lives was something that was certainly not um, an act of God, as, as we call it today. And um, in, at this time, in the 1940s, some young people, one of them, I mean, probably the more best known of these was Chitta Prashad, um, who was born Chitta Prashad Bhattacharya, but he um, he didn't want to use his surname because it, it was an upper caste uh, surname. And he, he, he decided, I mean, he became a part of the Communist Party of India. And along with his some of his friends, one of them particularly was a photographer called Sunil Jana, about whom I'm sure some of you will know. Uh, Chitra Prashad toured the villages of Bengal and he kind of in these very sort of poignant and accusatory lines almost uh, sketched the lives of the people who were dying in millions and while he was doing this it wasn't just a kind of you know self gratifying uh, visual journalism that he was doing he was actually working as a relief uh, worker he was trying to reach them down to the nearest orphanage to the nearest hotel trying to bring them food relief and um, he was kind of uh, an activist really in that time, 42, 43, and later in 44 as well. He tours parts of what is, I mean, present day Bangladesh. So this is again another kind of um, moment that really sort of um, jars and, and it kind of, I mean, there is really no going back to that kind of idealist, uh, Id, I mean, idyllic representation of rural Bengal after, I mean, this kind of sudden, uh, collapse and and this um, sort of you know mm. so this is by Zainu Labedin who was later I mean after after Bangladesh I mean after uh, partition was I mean was recognized as one of Bangladesh's foremost artists this is by Shomna Thor who later also covered um, various other uh, political events through pre and post independence India and you can see there, I mean, different ways of looking at the same moment. I mean, one is the Sunil Jana photographs and you have slightly more literal uh, sketches, but very powerful, uh, this kind of social realist mode of art that Chittu Prashad pioneers. And then you have these kinds of very expressionist almost works by Zainu Labedin and, um, and, and Shomna Thor. So... This again is an interesting phase because, like we were discussing, it um, kind of highlights that moment where there is a there is a kind of division between the nationalist, I mean, between uh, Indian political parties about what should be the primary goal, whether it's to defeat fascism, whether it's to get rid of the English, and um, lots of people get caught in the crossfire, basically. Mm. If there are any thoughts, any comments, please feel free to jump in uh, about this period or about, you know, what are the things that you'd like to ask your students to think about if, or students or museum visitors, whoever, I mean, um, whoever you're engaging with to think about when you look at these artworks or if any of these paintings, these drawing sketches speak to you particularly. So I'd love to know about that. So um, moving on, we can come back to this as well at some later point. Uh, while all of this is going on, Shanti Niketan, Rabindranath Tagore's university has kind of, you know, it's, it's becoming this uh, one of the foremost sort of centers of learning in, in the visual arts, of practice in the visual arts. And um, 
particularly on the left, this is work by Ram Kinkar Baij, who <clears throat> was born into, I mean, who was a Dalit, who who was born into a family of barbers. So they were they were originally known as Ram Kinkar. I mean, he was originally Ram Kinkar Pramanik, and um, he kind of arrived in Shantiniketan thanks to an introduction by an editor of uh, the Modern Review and Probashi. So these are I mean, journals that were coming out of Allahabad, it was edited by a man called Ramananda Chattopadhyay. And Ramananda Chattopadhyay introduced Ram Kinkor. I mean, Ram Kinkor's grandfather was a barber in Ramananda's household. And Ramananda introduced Ram Kinkor to Nandulal Boshu. And uh, when Ram Kinkor came to Nandulal Boshu with, uh, with a very kind letter of introduction from Ramananda, but also very uh, endearingly behind the introduction letter, Ramananda had actually drawn the direction map to where he could actually find Nandalal Boshu and Ram Kinkar followed that and he came to Nandalal and Nandalal said you know looked at his works and he said I have nothing to teach you because um, you seem to know exactly what you want to do and so this again was a kind of divergent it was a different branch of the modernism that um, that we find in Shantiniketan which is again a very sort of interesting experiment in this kind of local level um, uh, involvement in in in, in the local crafts, in, in a very strong, building a very strong connection with the community and with nature. And uh, you can see this, and this is by Binod Bihari Mukherjee, um, another remarkable student who emerges out of Shantiniketan. He later goes to Nepal, which is where he paints this. And later in life, he loses his sight, and he continues to make these amazing works, um, both in paint as well as in in collage and um, in in print. So this again is is uh, the the Shantiniketan school and a very different sort of trajectory that breaks off from it. Then coming to the independence period, just post independence, we have these couple of. I mean, these are just representations because Shito Prashad drew a whole sort of. I mean, whole series of. Uh, these sorts of cartoons that were satirical. They, you can see that, I mean, if you are familiar with the work of Gogonindranath Tagore, you can see that it takes off a bit from that, but it also has elements of the punch uh, cartoons, of, of the punch political satires that are coming out uh, s since the late 1900s, late, late 1800s, early 1900s. And um, these are Chitra Prashad's takes on, I mean, and, and the I mean, the way that, you know, the reason why yesterday we were discussing the possibility of, you know, dividing it up into historical periods. But one of the reasons why um, we like talking about art in this way is also because you um, notice that there are these, I mean, the, the artistic consciousness, conscience at times kind of, you know, works beyond these periodizations that we conventionally have and so it's very difficult I mean when you're looking around over here at this gallery to actually you know uh, think of where the independence movement would fall I mean these these traditions kind of overlap with the political timeline they intermingle with the political timeline and it, it really I mean that confusion is part of what I think is uh, so interesting about looking at history through the artworks rather than you know trying to uh, slot them into historical periods in a certain sense. So uh, Chitra Prashad again is a political consciousness, is an artistic consciousness that just kind of you know transcends that um, divide in between say pre-independence and post-independence India and right down to the 60s, 70s I mean he is active but he um, I mean he starts off working as a CPI, a uh, member of the CPI then he becomes a political activist He's working with the UNIS, I mean, with UNESCO, and he's working with these uh, larger sort of nas internationalist movements of um, right to food, right to education, and so on and forth. And in the meanwhile, he's drawing these really sort of um, hard-hitting, provocative uh, political um, cartoons, where you can see, I mean, this is so so unfortunately, I mean, repeated so many times, where the public safety bill is kind of brought in to quell uh, the common person's protest. And this is something where, you know, there is, of course, uh, images of capitalists 
above towards a richer life. They, they are reading a paper over here. It says, don't dare break public peace. And um, there's a man who's being squashed underneath this um, steamroller who's saying, keep your election promises and give us food, clothes, and house. So this is in 1947, and it's really anyone's guess which side of the independence, uh, which side of independence this is referring to. So beyond that, I think we can kind of, or we can again just pause here for a moment. I see a question. Um, that has come in it was considered a very bold step of the statesman to publish a certain shocking photo on the famine where artists warned persecuted in a similar manner um i am not i mean of course they were i mean persecution was quite quite um, bad in certain cases but uh, i am i'm not aware of um, any major uh, sort of persecutions that took place of course there are, there is a um, i mean chittu prashad's own sister uh, related the story that uh, many many copies of chittu prashad's um, journey i mean his book which was called hungry bengal which was a tour of bengal uh, villages in the in 1942 43 were allegedly burned by the british um, of which i mean a few surviving copies have come down to us so of course there was persecution but i don't know um, it seems to me from my reading of history that um, the persecution was in the 1930s was definitely more against uh, the communist uh, activists and the communist thinkers and what what were called the intellectual communists so the persecution is quite serious over there but um, I mean, I am not one hundred percent. I mean, I can't think of, uh, I can't recall from my limited knowledge any specific instance where an artist was targeted. Of course, writers were targeted quite frequently. Uh, activists were targeted quite frequently. Ma'am, uh, maybe. Yeah, uh, I wanted to just uh, bring in a general point mm -hmm. as a kind of a running thread mm -hmm. to what you've mentioned so far. Uh, especially after you discuss Ram Kinkar, uh, mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, one could look at the way in which uh, the content as well as the evolution of modern art took place in the context of the social background of the artist. Absolutely, absolutely. So, I mean, like, we don't highlight, highlight that uh, much. We assume that there is a kind of a egalitarian social space and that, you know, there's the gaze, I mean, you know, Chitanand, I think you're saying there's the gaze uh, of the other, you know, I mean, that you're looking at, um, of course, uh, folk art and all that, you are looking at it, I mean, you know, like as a, a medium to express mm -hmm. your mm -hmm. thing. I mean, so, I mean, it's not like a direct gaze, but as far as hunger is concerned, as far as uh, the downtrodden, the, you know, the poor and so on and so forth. So what is the, I mean, you said that he didn't use a second name because, you know, he was a Brahmin and yeah. so on and so forth. Uh, but that's not the issue. The issue is uh, the question of how you're perceiving mm -hmm. uh, the marginalized. Yeah. You know, this is something that is of great relevance to you. Absolutely, you know? absolutely. I mean, you know, it's this whole debate about who's talking about yeah, yeah. Who, or who's representing the other yeah. and so on. So I thought maybe as a kind of a general theme, mm -hmm. you're saying uh, to, uh, for, uh, for school children and the general thing about the museumification of, yeah, of yeah, art. Yeah. I think we should bring in the question. Of absolutely, school. absolutely. That's a very good point. I mean, we did, I mean, we do touch upon that a little bit when uh, we think of, say, women's art, I mean, women artists and women's representation. But uh, that conversation, I mean, Part of that is because, I mean, it's something that we also struggle with, which is that, I mean, even Ram Kinkar doesn't, uh, I mean, to my knowledge at least, he never really identified as a Dalit artist. But uh, when he comes to uh, Shanti Niketan, he first changes his surname because he is actually made to feel uncomfortable. And Shanti Niketan, despite Robindranath's best attempts, is still gatekept by uh, the upper caste and the upper class. And Ram Kinkar has to first change his surname to Ram Kinkar Dash. I think he signs it in a number of his early works. Then he signs it as Ram Kinkar Baed. And finally, he settles on Ram Kinkar Baed, which is a completely made up surname. So he actually has to kind of negotiate that in a way that is uh, quite, um, I mean, it's, it's not often discussed. 
but it's it's certainly very very significant um as for chitto prashad and his representation of this um of course like you're saying i mean it doesn't take i mean it doesn't remove your privilege by removing the surname itself and uh, however for him in this particular instance the one reason why he kind of chose to use this sort of almost sensationalist style is that um in the immediate context of his work he was essentially trying to um get word out that this famine was happening because there was literally no media coverage and everyone's attention was turned towards the second world war and uh, there was no media coverage and what chitra prashad was doing essentially was that i mean behind these artworks uh, when we uh, look at them in the museum we sometimes you know we flip them over and you have his detailed notes of who these people are what they are doing what their names are where he met them and all of that so he is really kind of documenting it and it was as uh, siloni was saying it, it was basically the first mainstream newspaper to report this was the statesman who essentially almost bodily lifted an article that was printed by uh, people's war which was the journal for which itto prashad was working so in a sense he was continuously sort of uh, provoking the middle class consciousness with these images to just draw attention to the fact that this was going on and no one was talking about it and in a sense it was almost an instrumental use of this kind of sensationalism yeah uh, that we find in his work but yeah, uh, your yeah. your response is uh, very good uh, and uh, uh, then uh, we also must consider that you know he had an ideological stand as well mm-hmm. and so it is related to all his actions so that's well taken uh, but the reason why i raise this point is because shona was talking earlier about how in the earlier phases a kind of elite reconstruction of the classical you know going yeah. back to ajanta and not then and in a later phase there is the elite uh, conscience that wants to go and own uh, the folk the cultural and so on so uh, these are all attempts of the dominant self mm-hmm. trying to define itself actually and its uh, incorporation of a larger social base for the national movement absolutely right so now who are these people who are being depicted or like for example um uh, well uh, you know the cultural other the social other uh, people with different faith backgrounds uh, etc and of course you mentioned ram kinkar and under that like it, that's an exception you know i mean but at the same time uh, is there a larger dialogue of course there isn't we know that but you know your craft what you're doing in this thing is to identify these phases yeah and while we are doing these phases i think like as a subtext it, this can also be brought in so it's not just mm-hmm. simply what you're depicting in the art but also that it is reflecting absolutely not only political absolutely. change but also social Yeah. Uh, transformation and churning absolutely yeah thank so you I thank you so much for that point yeah yeah. I, yeah 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 i mean it's something that you can in a sense only talk about through the absences but it's still uh, important to kind of uh, flag that when we are discussing these points and that's part of what um, i was hoping that we could also come back to which is about this whole question of uh, the folk identity and its overlaps with uh, what is considered the modernist um, style and and these um, problematic sort of um, so you're not going beyond partition but the more contemporary the bhopal a school of art etc etc that comes up and the way there is the appropriation of tribal artists into the domain of uh, defining mm-hmm. modern mm-hmm. art and all that i mean of course that this is the logic continuation of that you know yeah, where yeah, then yeah, the, absolutely. the tribal displaces yeah. uh, the thing but then what happens to him and his sensibility and one yeah. could go on and on and on about that but yeah. anyway i mean what you're doing is like fantastic and so i think if you br- we bring in this point uh, this will just add to it mm-hmm. no no thank you thank you so much yeah completely agree with you on that um so finally i think we just like to sort of close with a few of these images which um which are the products of you know um events that take place post independence um uh, this is most of this as you can see is is informed by this kind of urban romanticism and its discontents in a certain sense so 
this is a work by Bikash Bhattacharjee, which is called Flood, Dear Flood, uh, which was painted in 1982. And we have been wondering whether it's a reference. Um, Shumana, yesterday we were looking this up and um, she found references to the Urissa flood of 1982. And Bikash Bhattacharjee, of course, uses this um, sort of goes back to this realist mode of painting I mean, his, his technique in terms of this kind of academic realism is really quite astonishingly, um, I mean, it, it's quite astonishing. But what he does when he's looking at this kind of new um, dystopic urbanism, this new dystopic urban imagination, is that he's often kind of, you know, using these dismembered human forms to suddenly punctuate urban landscapes. So there are these uh, very disturbing images that he has that of, of dolls, of uh, sightless dolls that he suddenly plants in the middle of the cityscape, which are supposed to have been in, influenced by, I mean, inspired by, um, I mean, if there's a darker sense of the word inspired by, um, that's probably it, by the Nokshal movement in the, I mean, 19, early 1970s. And, that that kind of you know urban dystopianism is something that we see in the works of um, Prakash Karmokar, for instance. This is a work that that is known as Assassinated. So this is a kind of you know really disturbing time in the history of Bengal. I mean, these artists they were growing up looking very closely at the effects of partition, and um, it it kind of you know comes through in whatever work they do after that because there is really no going back to a uh, more um, sort of utopic idea, ideas of progress, of futurism, and so on in these works. I mean, it's, it's very, very bleak for the most part, um, or has, I mean, it, 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 I mean, history does cast these sort of dark shadows behind these figures, and it, it kind of reminds you of that uh, famous painting of the Doubting Thomas, where you um, where Thomas pokes an, a finger into Jesus's wound to see if he's in fact uh, flesh and blood, and um, it's it's quite um, powerful because you know there is also the sense that it's almost a biological curiosity. I mean, it's so so frequent that there's virtually uh, very little emotion in this. And then we turn to Robin Mondol, who again had a very difficult childhood growing up close proximity to the effects of partition of the refugee crisis that that gripped bengal in the 70s and um, again you can see these kind of this kind of you know the um, very vacant eyes i mean it's almost looking past you it probably doesn't even remember what question it was seeking answers to and these symbols of i mean robin mondol did this entire series of works of um, man sitting on throne-like things, man wearing an oversized crown and so on. So multiple, many, many symbols of uh, power and authority that were just, you know, not holding up to their promises. And we just wanted to close with a similar one because we, in our collection, we don't have one of Robin Mondol's Broken Thrones. This is by Shamal Dottorai, again, a very, very sort of romantic urban um, sensibility where you see this kind of a broken throne with um, architecture that's that can only be described as a kind of you know picturesque but postmodern picturesque in a certain sense. So uh, that is where our uh, viewing room basically brings us to an end. So I just like to stop here right now and um, invite you to think through the different phases that we covered today. To do a quick recap, we begin with the period just after Shadeshi when the nationalist movement is entering into its more mature phase, mature purely in terms of um, chronology, I mean, um, to the 1920s, the 1930s, then this kind of um, emergence of leftist art, uh, the famine and the emergence of Chittu Prashad and this kind of politically very, very direct, very confrontational art. And finally, going down from Shantiniketan's uh, kind of modernism to this kind of 
uh, urban dystopia that that grips art in Bengal in the decades after independence. So if you would like to reflect on anything, think about, you know, questions, or if you want to think of a particular artwork and tell us how you might um, interpret that for your students, we'd love to hear that from you. Any thoughts, comments? Um, yeah. Yeah. I guess the question also is like, do, do you think at all it is useful to look at these very familiar periods of history through through these artworks and the artists and their own pulpits and perspectives um, and their subjectivities? Do you think it would be relevant in your you know teaching environments, classrooms, uh, to to be able to do that again? Like Ham said, not as a source of information, but as the that you then throw in contrast with the narrative that we otherwise are taught about, the singular narrative that we're taught about history um, of South Asia. So just throwing that up as a provocation as to you know whether that might be an interesting proposition to run. These are, of course, objects from our collection, but it'll also be worth thinking about what are other museums in your area, in your localities that might have such artworks, objects, um, artifacts that do the same. Uh, that you know once again defamiliarize uh, you know otherwise familiar narratives of history for students and for uh, for educators. So just wanted yeah just wanted to sort of leave that as uh, you know our final thought on this. But yes, ma'am, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I wanted to say uh, since you're telling us to react to some of the specific things that you showed, I was just wondering uh, how would one um, how would one explain the last couple of uh, images. Uh, that you uh, showed us uh, uh, in the sense that, um, you know, when you're talking about dissemination of information to an audience that has, let's say, not gone through any traumatic events or even within their own uh, urban, whatever, life and, uh, and, and, and sojourn in, uh, in elite environments or even not so elite environments, how does one how does one address these issues of violence and trauma and things like that? That's a really interesting question. Because you know, um, you are telling us that we should view these, right? And we should take our students there and we should yeah. look at the visual. We should look at the visual and we uh, not as data and all that, but we should look at the visual. And in a sense, this visual is also experiential, no? Right. Um, so, I mean, Sorry, Megha, you were saying something? Yeah, I think I think what perhaps, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Shumana was uh, saying is, yes, we do, of course, uh, uh, approach it from the visual end, but with context, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Very much like the presentation that we've been through, the, you know, yesterday and today. So it, it, it that, that gives it a whole rounded meaning, right? But nonetheless, Megha, the, the visual is stark, no? I mean, right. it's like very gripping. Mm. Unlike, let's say, the more, if I can use the word, softer, sanitized, and, you know, thing. So I'm just talking pedagogically. I mean, yes, of mm. course, everything has to be in context. I mean, I would be the right. first person to emphasize that. And I've been raising this issue, etc. particularity of where how it emerged, the social context, the political context. But then there's something something very particular about a visual, about an artist, just like in, in literature also, no? Mm -hmm. no? So anyway, it's like what I mean, I I think, think like need to think about, no? I mean, no, how I think that's a good question because he, uh, one of the things that we also struggle with is that when we, um, I mean, we used to struggle with, in a sense, is that when we take people around the gallery, it's the same thing. Like we can, uh, it's it's much easier to kind of relate, say, Abhinandanath Tagore's uh, this Bharat Mata to the Swadeshi moment. It's much easier to relate, um, mm. even a Jamini Roy to the kind of um, regional nationalism and all of that. However, I think the 
point that I would like to kind of perhaps make with regard to someone like Shyamal Dutta Roy, who's on the right, or um, Rubin Mondol, is that I think what happens, say, after independence as this kind of new, um, uh, this this post-independence art emerges where you see Prakash Karmokar and uh, Bikash Bhattacharjee and Rubin Mondol and these people, is that it's no longer uh, related to a single historical moment, but to the historical subjectivity that forms their art. So in a sense, if we try to talk of, say, Rubin Mondol and why his figure looks like this, or, I mean, there are more examples at, at the exhibition as well. So I think the question then becomes, you know, uh, a series of events that mold his person, person that molds his artistic consciousness into something that produces this. So in a sense, it's not just one say, I mean, we can't really, I mean, conscientiously say that, you know, this relates to the 72 war or this relates to the 61 war. It's just that he is kind of growing up with this kind of um, looking at the partition, looking at uh, the refugee crisis, looking at the Calcutta killings. And um, these are just things that, I mean, there is this other work which I really like. I mean, maybe we could also have that somewhere, uh, which is by this artist called Nikhil Bishash, who paints this paint, who paints this picture of two clowns and jesters. So very much like Picasso, that kind of a thing. But they are so dark and they are so kind of, you know, um, sort of, I mean, not the kind of melancholy that we find in Picasso, which is a kind of almost romantic melancholy, but they are so sort of um, depressing because he he says that, you know, growing up, I went to the circus every winter with my father, but whenever I went to the circus, I used to not see these clowns and uh, jesters, but people behind them who were being, I mean, who had to do this for a profession and, and uh, generate a few laughs every evening. And and that was constantly, I mean, when he grew up looking at all of these events historically, he said that there was no way that I could paint these figures with any sense of innocence in them. So I think it's it's more, for me at least, it has been kind of adjusting to a different way of understanding the relationship between the artist and their historical uh, relationship with history, rather than looking at them as representations of uh, specific events. So in a sense, it, it covers a lot of things, but it doesn't talk about anything specifically. That makes sense. And I guess just adding to that, I guess if you, when we're starting with the image, so today a lot of it we're trying to balance between the two, sometimes starting with the image, sometimes starting with the context. But when we're starting with the image, say um, the image of Robin Mondral's, um, you know, the man on the chair, uh, you just start by saying like, what, who's this person? What is he or she feeling? Um, is she comfortable? Is he comfortable? Uh, what, uh, you know, what is, what has happened to them? Why are they like this? Uh, what does the chair represent? And really start breaking it down. And from that, then start connecting to who are people like this around you who see today, who might be similar to this man. And therefore, if you think back to the seventies, what are the, you know, people that this artist is trying to represent? So it starts with the, um, it also starts with the selfhood of the, of the student and their own experiences and getting them to see this image through their own posting and tying it back. That's sometimes, you know, what we do when we're doing this with students, we actually get people to this person. What are they thinking? Why are they here? Um, and it's people that was painting at a time. Artists in Bombay and the progressives, for example, were really experimenting with abstractionism. But he said that I can't, I can't move away from the human body and the human condition. Because uh, Devashi's a act second, act second. I can't move away from the human body and the human condition because that's all I'm seeing and that's all I'm obsessed with right now. So, I, you know, so that's I guess how we can start by by you know when you're starting with art, you all start also with a very at a very personal level. So, like Saloni um, mentioned that children, you know, emotions are evoked by historical occurrence. Children react with greater keenness. Journey, I think, when you're looking at art, taking it from the personal to the political, which you know, then back to the historical, which might be a nice uh, uh, thing to do. And this is what we this session, we're showing you one tool, which is a Kunz Matrix tool, which we will make available to all of you in case you want 
post these artworks in your own classrooms or share them with your own teachers. We'll also share a PDF on the History of Peace website of the artworks in case you want to show it more close up or use it, you know, in your presentations, you can do that. Um, and But also what we try to do, like you're saying, ma'am, we try to uh, create uh, during the lockdown, we realized a lot of students don't have access to, you know, they, co they couldn't access Zoom or they couldn't come and use a heavy, uh, you know, sort of bandwidth platform like this. We uh, created these, sorry, we created these WhatsApp modules. So each module was a, uh, well, had two videos. The first video was the artwork and gave the students a prompt to start thinking about it. And then the second video, once they got two, three days to finish the activity based on the prompt, they came back and they got to know a little bit about the history. So these were very homemade DIY videos that Shujan made in his backyard. Uh, but uh, that's something that we now want to actually, you really brought us to a wonderful point because we now uh, like to talk about how these artworks can then translate to uh, at least one mode of pedagogy that we've implemented with and hopefully, you know, unearth possibilities as well in the session. So we think on those modules and to see what else can do in terms of, you know, Pedagogy around art and around art from different periods of history. So. I think Rajasmita, uh, you have something to share in terms of uh, um, yeah, so uh, directly, yeah. Yes. So first of all, thank you uh, both. Yesterday and today were very, very good and very enriching. Um, so I work with Neha and Ranita at History for Peace, and we very recently, in fact, put together a little module on Shomnath Hor's works. Um, these were based out of the two, uh, two books that Seagal has published. Uh, one comprises of his sketches and his notes during the Tebhaga movement and the other one uh, in the Darjeeling Tea Gardens. So I just wanted to like bring that um, here and place it in front of you all because what we tried to do through the module was of course, bring in as many of his sketches as we possibly could, but also con contextualize them. And in a sense, give, I mean, give them a sense of where the artist was coming from. And also, um, I think one of the key questions that I was going with when I was working on this was they, like these, both of these incidents um, are, occur very close to, uh, close to the formation of the new nation. One, is ju just before and the other one just comes after it. And yet the experiences are so similar. So what happens with these questions of new nation of nationalism, colonialism, where, where are the, you know, where do the lines merge? Where, where are they so different? And then of course, bring that all down to the agrarian economy today and the peasants and farmers. So yeah, so if that's of any interest, we'd like to share that with you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks, Mega. I see you've shared the link. Yes, to I the have. Is that right? Thanks so much for sharing that. Um, thank you. Thank you, Sujan. Thank you, Shumana. And thank you, Aloka. You, you brought such interesting dimensions, as always, to okay. our sessions. I love interacting and I love the things that you do. So when I'm excited, then I interact. If I'm not excited, I don't interact. No, no, so it's nice it's to show it's, and, uh, it's a food for thought. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's really valuable. Yeah, it really is. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing everybody again next week. Yeah. Um, for two more days of very um interesting interactions. Yes. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Next week.